Good evening, Cliffview family. What a blessing it is to be before you to share with you a word from the Lord. It is my prayer that as we uh, enter into a Bible study on tonight, that you are informed, that you are inspired, and that you are encouraged to continue to live the lives that God has called you to live. We're going to go right into prayer and then right into our study for tonight. Let us pray. Eternal Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy. We are just so ever grateful that you have blessed us with this opportunity to convene on this platform to study yet another portion of your word. We pray to Father that we may hide your word in our hearts, that we might be better Christians this day than we've dared to be in the past. Help us, dear Father, to operate less on us and more on you. We love you. We thank you. We ask all of this in the name of him who said yes to the cross. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Once again, it's so good to see you on uh, tonight. Uh, as promised, uh, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 18, uh, just to get a glance at the confidence of our salvation. Uh, I've said it, stated the last couple of weeks that God does not want us walking on eggshells. God does not want us to be unsure about our salvation. God does not want us to have any doubts, but rather he wants us to grow in him, grow in his son, grow in the spirit, grow spiritually uh, so that we can make a dent in the kingdom of darkness while being citizens in the kingdom of God's dear son. And so here's what we're going to do. First Peter chapter four, first Peter chapter four and verse number 18, first Peter chapter four and verse number 18, there the Bible reads, now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Uh, now, it's very interesting, as I stated before in our previous studies on how to study the Bible, that every passage of scripture must be interpreted within the scope of its context. That is, there are verses above and verses below the very verse under consideration that we are seeking to understand. And so that means that when I read 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 18, so the righteous shall scarcely be saved, I cannot build a doctrine on that one verse without giving due consideration to the context of that one verse. I want to understand what Peter was communicating to the first century readers when he penned 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 18. In order to get that understanding, I have to look at the context. It's almost like you enter a room and you see a four-page letter sitting on the desk and is opened up to the third page. And you start reading the third paragraph of the third page of the four page letter. And you begin to try to understand and interpret what it is that you're reading without reading the rest of the letter to find out exactly what's going on. The same thing applies when it comes to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 18, because this particular passage has been misinterpreted often. Uh, it has left some to believe that they cannot be certain of their salvation or that if they're going to be saved, they are going to barely enter into glory, that they're going to do just enough good over and above the bad to get in to glory. Brothers and sisters, this is not Peter's message. This is not Peter's intent. This is not what the first century readers understood. All right. And so let's look back at first Peter chapter four and verse 18. Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? All right. And so we got two groups of people. We have the righteous and we have the ungodly and the sinner. All right. The ungodly and the sinner fall in the same category. And then you have the righteous one in the other category. In order to understand 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 18, we have to go back to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 12, because this is where the context of this passage begins. There the Bible says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, 
which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, uh, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? All right. And so we see the context is suffering. The context is persecution. The context is difficulty. As a matter of fact, when you look at the word scarcely in 1 Peter chapter 5 in verse 4 rather in verse number 18, it is translated with difficulty. Difficulty. The difficulty according to the context is the fiery trial that we read in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 12. So when you consider fiery trial, a fiery trial is a trial that is designed to bring the best out of you. Uh, it is a term of refinement. It carries the ideal of the purification of gold, where the ancient goldsmith will melt down gold in a pot. And when he melts it down, uh, he then skims off the impurities uh, off the top, and he continues this process until he sees his reflection in the gold. When he sees his reflection in the gold, then he knows the gold is pure. The audience to which Peter is writing had impurities in their lives. And God says, I need you to be better. I need to refine you. And I'm going to refine you through the vehicle of persecution. I'm going to allow you to go through some difficulties in life in order to bring out the best in you. He says, I need to see the reflection of my son face in your life. I need to see Jesus in you. And in order for that to take place, you got to go through some stuff. You got to go through some storms. You got to go through some sufferings. You got to go through some persecutions. You got to enter glory with difficulty. That does not mean that I'm barely going to make it in. It simply means that when I get in, I have done so having gone through difficulty in this life. Any of us, many of us, all of us can testify to the fact that we've dealt with difficulties. We dealt with persecutions. We dealt with sufferings. And these things have been designed in our lives, tailor-made for our lives, in order for us to look more and more like King Jesus. The problem with building a doctrine on one verse is that you miss the context and you miss the meaning. But when we take 1 Peter 4, 18, the righteous shall scarcely be saved or with difficulty be saved, we understand that this eternal salvation is tied to the difficulty that he has to experience or she has to experience while on earth. As a matter of fact, the entire book of First Peter deals with suffering. The children of God faced fierce persecution under Nero, who reigned from AD 54 to 68. He was the first emperor to inflict physical persecution upon the children of God, killing them, putting them before people, having lions uh, ravage them and destroy them uh, before the people. And so we, we see that they're going through some, some difficulty. But Peter says, listen, first of all, I, I love First Peter 4, 12. He says, beloved. He says, regardless of what you're going through, how fierce the persecution is, 
how, how difficult the suffering is. He says, beloved, which is agapetas in the original language, which means you are loved by God. You must never doubt the fact that God loves you even when you are in your storm, in your difficulty. He still loves you. And this love that comes from God is a sweet pillow of rest upon which for you to lay your head as you go through the storms of this life. But now I want you to also look at another passage uh, of scripture just to get a better idea of this term scarcely because it's used in another place in the New Testament. Turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 and verse number 18. Acts chapter 14 and verse number 18. Uh, here we find Paul uh, in his first missionary journey. He is in Lystra. Uh, he's preaching the gospel. Uh, these folk have said, listen, man, you are a God. All right. And so they began to offer sacrifices unto Paul as a God, because he spoke boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ. Watch Paul's response in Acts 14 in verse number 18. The Bible says, and with these sayings, they could scarcely, there's that word again, restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. In other words, they had difficulty, all right? It had nothing to do with barely making it in. They had difficulty, the same term in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 18, restraining these folks, stopping these folk from sacrificing unto them as if they were gods, all right? And so this term means difficulty. It means difficulty. It doesn't mean that I barely get in. It doesn't mean that you barely get in. We need to get rid of that doctrine. We need to delete that understanding or misunderstanding from our minds and understand that we got to go through some stuff in order to be refined and look more like Jesus. We ought to be confident, church, in our salvation. We ought to walk with boldness, talk with boldness, live with boldness, speak with boldness because of this salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. Just because you are a child of God does not mean you are exempt from storms, troubles, trials, tribulations. It just simply means I got to go through it. I got to go through it. Before I get to him, I got to go through it. I got to go through some sufferings. I got to go through some pains because God says, listen, uh, everything about you ain't right, but that's all right. I'm going to get you right through the process of persecution and suffering. I'm going to put you in the smelting fire. I'm going to refine you through the fiery trials. I'm going to skim off the impurities in your life so that I can see the reflection of my son in your life. I had to go through it. Uh, to look like Jesus. I had to, I had to go through some difficulties and some challenges in order to conform to the image of God's dear son. And so don't misunderstand Peter when he says, for the righteous one shall scarcely be saved, because if the righteous one scarcely being saved means that he is saved with difficulty in his life and God is bestowing upon him or her disciplinary judgment that is designed to help them look more and more like Jesus, what's going to happen to the ungodly in the sinner who has rejected truth altogether, who has rejected God altogether, who has rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ altogether? If the righteous is going to get to glory, having gone through disciplinary judgment in order to look more and more like Jesus, what shall the end of those be who have rejected Jesus Altogether, this is the contrast that Peter is drawing in First Peter chapter four and verse number eighteen. And so, I just need us to be informed. I need us to understand. I don't need us to just read a passage and then run with it uh, with an understanding that was never intended for you to have. We need to understand scriptures in their given context. And when we understand scriptures in their given context, God is glorified. We are edified. We are strengthened to continue to walk the walk and fight the good fight of faith. All right. And so when your faith is in Jesus Christ, the same faith that you put him, put in him rather, when you were initially saved is the same faith that you need for you to stay saved. You can be confident in your salvation 
Let me say that again. You can be competent in your salvation. Trust in him and not in yourself. All right. Trust in him. And when you trust in him, then there is no doubt whatsoever about your eternal salvation, your current state now or your eternal salvation then. I, I pray that this has given you some enlightenment. Enlightenment. Uh, I pray that you understand this passage just a little better. If you still have some questions, uh, then, then call me. Uh, we get together or just ask me in person uh, and I'll give you some, some additional information uh, just to help you to understand uh, this marvelous relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that our living for him fully is built upon the foundation of understanding uh, the relationship that we have with him. When we understand the relationship that we have in him, with him, uh, it, it helps us to, to truly live the life he has called us to live. And it's just my prayer that uh, just based on the studies that we're going to be doing in Galatians, that you fall more and more in love with Jesus, that you fall more and more in love with God, his Holy Spirit, the word of God, because that will forever change your life. It's my prayer that this has been uh, beneficial to you. Love you. And we're going to close with a word of prayer. Eternal Father, once again, we come before your throne of grace and mercy. We thank you for the sign that you have given us, dear Father, to uh, look at your word, dear Father, to get a better understanding of your word. We're so grateful, dear Father, for Jesus. We're so grateful uh, for the challenges of life. We're so grateful for the refining process. We're so grateful for you skimming the impurities out of our lives so that you can see Jesus in our lives. We pray, dear Father, that we will understand these difficulties, dear Father, through your eyes, through your lenses, dear Father. They're designed to make us better and not bitter. We just pray now, dear Father, that you'll bless us with the ability, dear Father, to endure so that we can be transformed and conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, dear Father, for those who are sick, dear Father, those who are still suffering with the loss of loved ones. We pray, dear Father, for uh, this weekend, dear Father, this, this picnic, dear Father, in Marshall, Texas, at the ranch, dear Father. We just pray that you'll bless us with safe travel there. Help us to have a wonderful time in you, dear Father, a great time in fellowship and fun, dear Father. We just pray, dear Father, that you just continue to look down upon us and shower us with your blessings. And dear Father, we are ever careful to give you all praise, to give you all glory, to give you all honor. It is in the sweet and in the powerful name of Jesus that we lift this prayer. Amen. God bless you.